Hey everyone, welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and I'm so happy you'll be joining us for this interview. On today's show, we have Kara Lamore, founding member of the bassoon quartet, The Breaking Winds, and bassoonist of the wind quintet, Wind Sync. This talk was a great example of career evolution as Kara took us back to the beginning of The Breaking Winds. She started her bassoon quintet while still an undergrad and had had no idea where it would go in the future. She shared stories of how it has grown and changed over the last seven seasons and told us about getting started on tours, adding comedy and other things like costumes and dance, and how this evolution led to who they are today. We also got to talk a little bit about WinSync's most recent endeavor, the Onstage Offstage Music Festival. This is a great interview for any musician to hear who is considering this type of career. But before we get started, I want to thank Fix Music for providing the hosting for the show. When you're looking for high-quality sheet music at affordable prices, look no further than fixmusic.com. And get this, they are making so many improvements to their site. Starting now, they have lots of music for all the strings, as well as continuing to add music for winds and brass. They've improved checkout to use real-time quotes for priority two to three days and priority express overnight shipments. And unlike many of their competitors, they don't pad these methods to make more money. If you need it fast, they will get it to you as cheaply as possible. They also have some really new, fantastic options for making music buying easy for students through teachers and schools. Haven't we all had that problem where you ask students to get something for their lessons and they come back saying they couldn't find it, or the music store didn't have it, or any other number of excuses? Let Fix Music take care of this problem for you. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. And for Crushing Classical listeners, just for you, use the discount code CRUSH and get 10% off your order now. Check them out at fixmusic.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. Hi, Kara. How are you? Good morning. I'm okay. How are you? Great. Thank you for being on today. Um, so, Kara, you are the bassoon player in Winsync, and also you have your own group called um, the Breaking Winds, which is a bassoon quartet, right? That's right. All right. So how did you come up with the name The Breaking Winds? Well, we were in college, so you can imagine we were going for something kind of funny and perhaps <laughs> slightly controversial. But Right. But our group's name actually references sort of this age-old nickname for our instrument, for the bassoon, which has to do with flatulence. Um, <laughs> so if you don't mind, it's called the farting bedpost. And that's something people have been telling us for years, you know, as bassoonists. Oh, ha ha, you play the farting bedpost. Uh -huh. But we thought that by naming ourselves in honor of that old joke, we could kind of situate ourselves in actually this long tradition of the bassoon being a rather humorous instrument. That's a great idea, you know, and it's funny, you know, people always say that, like, right, you can't get made fun of if you're just laughing with them. Like, yeah, that's funny. Hey, this is cool. And then it becomes like not the joke anymore, but just the thing, you know. So that's that's really funny. You know, I to be honest, I had never heard anyone call a bassoon a farting bedpost. So oh, well, really welcome to our world. <laughs> I mean, I always I'm a horn player, so I'm always people that don't know the horn very well are like, oh, don't you play that instrument that can make elephant sounds, you know? So it's a little similar, but oh, um yikes. so um so you've been doing um the breaking winds for a while, correct? Yes. So that group was founded in two thousand eight and we played our first recital in the dorm recital hall. Oh wow. <laughs> and where which school was that? We were all sophomores at the Eastman School of Music, and we were all friends from studio class, actually. That's great. So at that time, did you have um, an idea that you were going to keep going well past college, or were you just doing it for fun or for a chamber music credit? Or Yeah, so that's the thing. It was definitely just for fun. And actually, I think we each had more traditional woodwind quintets that we were playing in in order to get that chamber music credit. So the reason uh -huh. why we played together is because 
jury week was kind of confused that year where the sophomores did juries in the winter, but not the spring. And then everybody else had spring juries. So we essentially had a week off and we were just looking for something to do that would be fun instead of practicing Mozart concerto again and again. So yeah, we were reading through quartets in the studio after studio class and ultimately decided that it would be kind of a fun stress relief sort of thing for our friends at the end of jury week. And we did basically a brunch recital. We fed them bagels and gave them little party gifts and things like that just to be a fun recital. That's so neat. And then, um, and then you started making a, um, arranging, did you do your own arrangements? Yes, eventually. So when we began, we were mostly using pieces and arrangements by members of the bubonic bassoon quartet. And if you're not familiar with them, I highly recommend their old recordings. They can be found floating around online. But that ensemble had a number of bassoonists who ultimately became big names, actually, like John Miller, for example, of the Minnesota Orchestra. But We were kind of inspired by that and wanted to add our own spin to that model. So then we started doing arrangements. And I think I was the first person who did one. And it was the Lady Gaga saga. I think that was actually our very first arrangement in 2010. Oh, wow. And And had you had experience doing arranging before? No, not really. It's funny because... We would be asked to arrange things or compose little things for theory class. And I had definitely dipped my toe into the water of doing composition in high school, but Mm -hmm. I had never done a bassoon quartet arrangement before, obviously. Or and I don't really remember ever arranging anything for, you know, piano or something simpler either. I just went for it. That's great. That's really great. And so through that, um, how did you start doing things that, you know, working in comedy and other, you know, different kinds of things into your performances? How did that evolve? Well, I think because the group did start as this just for fun, jokey, after class sort of activity, I think that our creative juices were just naturally a bit more flowing. And yeah, even from the very beginning, we were thinking, why don't we try dancing? Why don't we try standing to play which at that time that was radical even just standing to play and it took some courage actually um trying to work that into our performances so eventually we were just hard to do that well is it hard to do that for bassoon yes it's a bit hard um just because you have to make sure that you have a neck strap that you like and that you know how Mm -hmm. to balance the instrument right But eventually, you know, we were doing choreography and just like having the time of our lives coming up with goofy ways to spin each piece we were working on. And after you're dancing and adding so much extra that's not just the music, standing to play is the least of your worries. Right. (laughs) (laughs) What did that do for what did that do for your level of, you know, everyone gets a little nervous before they perform, but when you're adding all these different elements, did that, did that change how you felt about performing in general, as far as that part is concerned? Yes, but I think in a positive way. And I think that that's the case for each of the four of us, because Uh it's sort of like if you're wearing a costume at Halloween, you can feel emboldened to do something out of character for yourself, you know? Uh And adding more crazy performance elements can actually make you feel like it's okay to be very extroverted in how you approach performing. And it certainly had that effect for me. Yeah. That's so interesting. So um, I noticed that you have a really great mission statement on your website about, um, well, I'll just read it. It's, it says that your mission is threefold to navigate the intersection of classical music, pop culture, and comedy to expand the scope of bassoon performance and to create meaningful bonds with audiences. I love how it's three parts, how you have, you really, you know what kind of music you want to merge and, and then also bring in pop culture. And then 
expand the scope of bassoon performance because I can imagine that um, a person would probably feel like as a bassoon player, gee, you know, how am I going to create something outside of an orchestra job if I wanted to do something different for a classical career? So you're definitely showing that through what you do. And then on top of that, creating meaningful bonds with an audience. I mean, that's something that classical musicians tend not to pay as much attention to, especially in an orchestra where you're, you've got the comfort zone of, you know, 80 other people and you, you know, there's a big separation there between audience, you know, so you're doing so many awesome things all within that mission. So how did you, how did you write that? I mean, is that something that you just developed over time or did everyone sit down and say, okay, we're writing the mission statement today or how does that work? Sure. So it's definitely something that arose organically over time for us. And I think that does sort of go back to the origins of that ensemble as having been something that originally wasn't necessarily intended to be a component of our careers. So mm -hmm. our, I think our group's identity kind of formed organically over time. For example, you know, we never expected to have a viral YouTube video. And actually, when we first started performing, I don't even think that that was a thing. Like, I don't think viral videos, <laughs> I don't think people used the word viral or any of that. So, you know, it's something right. we couldn't have even anticipated. Um, I don't think we could have anticipated that we would want to tour in our hometowns. And then ultimately that we would be touring all over the world. Some of these huge steps that we took sort of arose just yeah. because each step led organically to the other. So with that, you know, the identity of the ensemble in terms of the repertoire we're playing and who we were as musicians, that too kind of evolved since we had started with some of these older, more established quartet pieces and just started experimenting. And we realized that we were really excited about that pop culture angle and that we really did want to play up certain aspects of the comedic uh, performance style. So yes, those came over time, but this mission statement is one that we came up with about a year and a half ago. So it's actually very recent and it's something that we did when we did decide we really wanted to narrow our focus a bit more and make sure that each of our activities was really serving uh, the goal of our mission. So we kind of did approach it at that time almost like a new nonprofit organization would be approaching it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I love the way you described it just now because... Um, it really did evolve over time, you know, how you said that you started with traditional quartets and then gradually evolved into arranging and then noticed that you wanted to add more of the comedy into it. So it's just, it's neat to watch an evolution because now that you've been in existence for so long, you can look back and see how gradually you've changed and, and incorporated other things or spent more time bringing other things into the scope of what you do. It's really cool to see. And so um, I, I saw you've been on a lot of tours, right? All over the country and the world. Tell me something, a little bit about um, some of the tours you've done. Sure. So our very first major tour was also probably the hardest one. We were in Texas and we did a school tour and we booked ourselves very tightly, sometimes playing six or seven shows in a day but we really wanted to hit as many schools oh as God. we could yes it was grueling um but it was an amazing learning experience it taught us how to get our own bookings how to arrange an itinerary for example which is one of those funny details that you might overlook at first and and it showed us sort of um what it, what it's like to go out into the community and what forms that connection most quickly, for example. And so that was a really important one. And we've been back to Texas several times since. 
Our most memorable tour was probably our first international tour, and for now, our only one, but hopefully that changes soon, which was our Asia tour. And so we were in six cities in China, and then we went to Japan because that was when the IDRS conference, International Double Read Society, was in Tokyo. So we kind of knew already okay. that we wanted to be in Asia that summer just because we knew about that conference. And we were just fortunate to be able to organize a tour through a few different connections that would lead up to that. Okay. So did you do all the arranging of where you were going on that tour by yourselves? We essentially did, although we were lucky, again, to have some contacts who knew people in China. And it, for cities where we knew that we kind of wanted to be, but we didn't have gigs officially confirmed, for example, we then reached out to mm -hmm. our networks of friends. So it was a real mix and it was pretty tough to put that one together too, but like very rewarding. That's great. I bet it's a, I bet it's difficult to plan all the way um, in Asia and everything. So you guys are, you guys want to do some more tours, some more international tours? Yes, that's very rewarding. Um, we were able to meet with students, for example, in Chengdu and learn more about music education there, which I think was very enlightening to us as far as programming goes. And another interesting aspect is that because mm -hmm. our ensemble does comedy skits, we were able to test drive some of our humor with an international audience. And some things did flop, which was really interesting. Right. And then some things were, you know, very <laughs> translatable. And that was really exciting to see as well. <laughs> Tell me about one of the things that flopped. Do you have a, a memory of what, what one of them was? Oh, <laughs> well, we, tr we try to do sort of slapstick things with no language so that you don't necessarily need to speak the same language, you know, to be able to understand. But um, we did a skit where it becomes apparent through some dialogue that we usually do that there's a printing issue with our sheet music so then when we have difficulty reading our music later on in the skit it makes a lot of sense because people realize oh no this printing difficulty is interfering with their performance um and I'm just not sure that that was mm -hmm. necessarily communicated during the performance so we started throwing our music and the audience was a bit stunned and I think worried for us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. <laughs> You're probably like, um, where, why aren't people laughing? Right yeah. Now? <laughs> I mean, it's fine. I was going to keep throwing my music no matter what. <laughs> That's great. Um, so you essentially, so you're in two self-run chamber ensembles and um, both extremely creative and busy. So what is that like to do both wind sync and the breaking winds? Is it difficult to balance both of those between all the work that you need to do and performing and everything? Yes, I think it's a challenge. So yes. Um the problem is I, I just like so love both of these ensembles and just kind of want to go to the ends of the earth for each. Of course, the Breaking Winds, as a founding member, I, I do feel this sort of special obligation to nurture my baby in a way there. Um, yeah. So, so for the breaking winds, for example, I still work on bookings and things, which I don't really do for my wind quintet, wind sync. But um, in terms of scheduling, mm -hmm. sometimes I do have to get a sub, for example. And for learning repertoire, I'll often have to study my repertoire for the next week while I'm still on tour this week with, you know, my other ensemble. And that's just something that I navigate right. week by week, basically. But 
I'm fortunate to have colleagues who also have widely varied careers and, you know, are really making waves in their own various ways outside of the ensembles. And they've been really great about letting me just communicate with them what's going on and um, helping me (laughs) to uh, reach a compromise between those two calendars. That's great. That's really great. Cause I, I understand why you would look at the soon group as your baby since you started and it's been in existence for so long. So it's really great that you can do both things. So, um, so you just finished, um, last week you were doing your chamber music festival called on stage off stage, um, with wind sync. And I interviewed two of your colleagues last week about it about and it was like two days before the festival started and I was excited to talk to you today because now this is the after you can tell me how it went and and everything else so tell me how the um, festival went for you guys okay well I'm happy to report that it went really well like actually it was just charmed in certain ways so I'm really excited about that and I think we were all just really thrilled by the end to see how things had come together. It was a pretty big undertaking. So Ani and Garrett, who you talked to last week, they had begun plans for this over a year ago. And that, of course, helped because we had developed these relationships with Houston Youth Symphony, whose Coda Music Program performed with us, and with Kinetic Ensemble, which is a string ensemble here in Houston that's basically a recent startup, a conductorless orchestra. So we were just lucky to have these collaborators who had been on board for long enough and kind of understood what we were trying to do so that we could then sort of expand the festival beyond that. Um, Because we were playing at Mm -hmm. a farmer's market and in a park, some of these outdoor spaces, We had to battle with concerns about Houston weather in April, which for those who aren't familiar, it's it's raining on and off basically constantly. Um, And so we were battling wind and humidity actually on Saturday during our children's show. But the amazing thing is there's just sort of a need and a want in this community for entertainment like that. And we actually had a good crowd and... The kids didn't care. They don't care about the weather. They were really awesome audience members this weekend. (laughs) Um, Our big main stage concert this weekend had, I believe, 85, 86 musicians on stage. And so that was a long day of figuring out stage diagrams and then moving things an inch and then, you know, reconsidering and then moving things another inch. But the end result was this product that felt very special and it really did feel like a coming together of some important musical forces in Houston. So it was really cool. That's great. Will you do it again? Yes. We've been calling it the first annual because we've fully intended all along to have it be basically a yearly week of celebrating places and people and spaces and music here in Houston And I think some of these concerts that we've done, we certainly are anxious to repeat as soon as possible. Um, And we'll probably keep dreaming about other elements that we want to add to that festival. That's so great. It's so exciting to to start something and see how now you're at the beginning of the onstage offstage festival and you know how things evolve over time. So it's it's really exciting that you've got a new project um, that you just started. It's great. So um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about um, money and how was it when you first started and um, with your ensemble, the bassoon ensemble, and also with Winsync, was it hard at the beginning to generate an income for yourself? Well, yes. I think that basically everybody tells you I had been warned since high school, basically, that it's very difficult to um, make a ton of money as a musician. And that's not why you go into music. You know, you always hear all those things. I was kind of lucky with these ensembles in that 
I wasn't necessarily expecting that that would be my career at first, which then allowed me to take more risks, I think, because I thought, okay, I'll just do something else for money. I want to do this crazy passion project right now. I'm just going to throw everything into it and see what happens. Um, So while many people will start off with a really detailed plan and that can really pay off, I basically had no plan (laughs) and was just adding things as I went. But with (laughs) the Breaking Winds, uh, we started off playing playing gigs for free. I think this is a very typical experience. We were playing gigs for free. We were basically volunteering all of our time and even using our own money to buy costumes, to pay for recordings, all of these things. Uh, and then we ended up shifting into more of a model. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the model that we use now is probably more familiar, where we have a few different income streams. We have some passive income from CDs, merchandise, sheet music. And we also have some active income, which is the touring component. Um, and then in the case of the Breaking Winds, mm-hmm. we have just a really remarkable community online who we interact with and through that community we've also had some crowdfunding sort of um, income streams as well and that's been really really cool actually like that's we weren't even necessarily expecting that that would be something viable for us and I'm not sure it's super viable for any given ensemble but we just happen to have this really robust following online who are very good to us um with WinSync WinSync was founded um at Rice University so they're like kind of similar to the Breaking Winds where that was a student ensemble that grew into a career but WinSync does have a little bit more <laughs> I hesitate to use the word traditional, but it's like a little bit more of a traditional sort of business model um, where it's been a nonprofit for a few years. And um, we operate in many ways, just like the local symphony would, um, as far as how the business is run in Houston. So WinSync does have a board and it's all Houston based. We have, I believe, eight community members and it does kind of change over time and rotate but they serve on our board yeah and we do you know development fundraising grant writing a lot of the typical sort of things that a symphony or any larger arts organization would do oh okay that's that's great so now now would you say that um between your two ensembles you're making a full-time income or do you also freelance or teach lessons? I am close to a full-time income, but yes, I freelance and I teach. So I get gigs when I can on weeks off, which are kind of few and far between at this point. And, and I do teaching as well, but yeah, something that's pretty awesome about, Something that's awesome about my life right now is that I am uh, all (laughs) music-based income. So that, to me, is really great. When I was in grad school, I had to do, like, extra tutoring, and I had to work at Starbucks, and I did all of those things. Um, And I say had just because my goal even then was to have all music-based income. Um, That Those are, of course, totally fine jobs to be doing and they can be good actually because then you're not necessarily focusing all your energy on perfecting your craft um, and things like that but yes I'm close between my two ensembles and very grateful for it that's great and I know that's most people's goal as a musician to make all their money from their you know their art and playing music and but I know it's not always uh the case so yeah I mean I personally had to work in restaurants and stuff like that too so and hey you know what free coffee right yes 
you're you're actually forced to take coffee at Starbucks. Little known secret. <laughs> forced to take it, really? Yeah, my manager would check in at the end of the week and make sure that I had taken my bag of coffee. You have to take a pound every week. <laughs> I did not know that, but I I suppose um they don't really have to twist people's arm. I mean, you can always give it away or, or just, dr- I mean, if you're drinking it at work, I don't know if you really make it at home, but um, that would be a lot of coffee. <laughs> well, yeah, it's good um, for Christmas. Yeah, I bet it is. Totally. Um, so on my podcast all the time, I, I ask everybody um, about their crossroads moments. I call it like the screw this moment where you're, you know, chugging along in your career and, maybe something's not really working for you the way that you want or something happens and you're just like, you know what? Screw this. I got to go in the more um, unknown route and make a change in my life. And I want to know if you've had a moment like that in your career where you said, screw this, I'm going the unknown path. Sure. I'm a person who has moved around quite a lot and I do find that I'm kind of better at uh at maybe moving on to something new and different than some of my friends are and I'm actually trying to get myself to stay in one place but Mm -hmm. I will say so rather than saying screw this I think it's more of like a thing where I'm grateful that I had the one opportunity but I just feel like I must leap into the unknown. And I mean, the most recent moment for me was last spring, basically, because from 2014 to 2016, I had a full-time faculty position at the University of Missouri. And I I did leave that in order to do this more freelance-esque lifestyle where I'm playing with WinSync and the Breaking Winds and doing a little bit of freelancing in Houston as well. And I mean, it was a difficult decision because for two years, I was basically living this life that through most of my education, I had seen as basically a pinnacle sort of career where I finally had this full-time job and I was getting a salary as a musician, which we all just dream of through our whole education. (laughs) And, um, Mm -hmm. and I liked the experience actually, and I'm grateful to have had it. And I also realized that if I wanted to continue throwing everything I had into a passion project, like these creative projects that I do through chamber music, that the time was now and that um, I, I had a suspicion that I would actually feel more fulfilled doing that at this time than I would in a more like prescribed role at a full-time job. So that's why I left. Um, and I'm happy to report that it was a good move for me and I definitely feel very driven by the work I'm doing this this season. And I've actually noticed a big decrease in my stress level, which has matched the big decrease in my income. (laughs) And that's okay. I actually feel healthier now and (laughs) I can dream about the future and sort of do all those things that we, that we also hope to do during our education as musicians. That's so inspiring. I, you know, I know it must be really hard to leave um, a situation where you have a full time salary, but at the same time, you know, you can't do something that you're doing just for the money, you know, so um, I mean, not that you were doing it just for the money, because I'm sure you love teaching too, but, but you knew where your passion was. And so you made that move, even though I'm sure it's, it's hard when you have the stability here for you for in the, in the way of, um, a steady income. So, um, yeah, that's really inspiring. It really is. Um, so what is your next big goal in your career right now? 
Well, I knew you would ask that. And I was kind of scared to say what what I want to do because I thought, what if I don't actually do it? But I'll tell you. So I intend to work on a few composition projects. And um, I definitely have one in mind for a children's show for The Breaking Winds. I don't want to give away too much. Um, and I'd also like to work on something for wind's sake. But I have this feeling that I've been working in this performer mode for long enough that my creativity needs a bit of a shock. And I really think that composition is the way to do this. If we're musicians, you know, you speak a language, for example, you speak it, you read it, you write it. I would like to be able to do the same in music, to speak it, to read it, and to write it. And I don't have a lot of experience with the writing part. So that is my goal. And I hope to start work on that over the summer. I love the way you relate it to speaking a language because that I've always felt that that is um, a big missing part in my education and my ability as a musician, totally. So, and I think as, as modern musicians in this day and age, when um, we're looking to keep classical music alive in, in new and different ways, like you're doing with your ensembles, it's so necessary for people to try it. And, and um, that's what you're doing, which is so inspiring. Well, thanks. Wait till you hear the music, though, before you say anything. <laughs> um, so I have two more questions for you, Kara. Um, what is the one habit or behavior you've developed that has made the most difference in your career so far? Well, any boss who I've had knows that there are certain habits that I still need to develop. And I'm working on it. But I will say one that has really um, come through for me has been just asking. So, you know, anytime I've had even a little baby dream or kind of a hunch that something's going to be interesting and that I'll want to pursue a project, I've just asked around um, because I'm, I'm that person who's always on Google and on Wikipedia trying to learn more and more and more. So I think it connects to that sort of habit that I have. But mm -hmm. just asking if I want a gig, hey, do you know of a place where we could play? Or if I want to make a connection with a collaborator, hey, do you know how I can get in touch with such and such person? And these really simple questions, just asking how I can put things into effect, often simply do put them into effect. Um, because as soon as other people know about, you know, whatever project I'm dreaming up, um, they'll often contact the next person who will help me, who contacts the next person who will help me. And so I would say it's that. I think there's a bit of a concern that you have to go through these traditional channels to achieve anything, right? You have to play the audition to get the gig or you have to get a certificate in this field in order to work in the field, whatever it is. But that's honestly not necessarily the case. I think just by, um, by going for it and attempting to put something into practice, you can often get down that path faster. I love that. That is so great. I've, we've been talking about um, breaking the rules lately at Crushing Classical. And I feel like that really speaks to breaking the rules in a way, you know, you know, you're saying, um, you don't necessarily have to go through traditional um, channels to get what you want all the time. And I love that uh, you're thinking outside the box in that way. That's really great. So um, who I have one more question, who in the classical world inspires you and tell me why in one sentence? Well, I'm I feel like one sentence just won't pan out for me. But let me try. Um, for me, my inspiration comes from my teacher. His name is Christopher Millard, and he currently plays bassoon at the National Art Center Orchestra in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And what I like about his style is that he has a deep intelligence for 
for the traditions of our craft and and a deep love for that. But he also has a curiosity and intelligence in other fields like instrument repair, read making, podcasting. He actually started a podcast before anyone knew what it was, visual art. Um, and he's just a brilliant collaborator in that way. That's great. That's very cool. That's so inspiring. Um, Kara, today, the, this has been great having you on today. I really appreciate you coming on and telling us all about your ensembles and everything that you do with them. And um, I look forward to seeing all the things that you do with your ensembles in the future, because I feel like it's, even though they've been they've been going for a while, it seems to me that you just have so much more vision for what's coming in the future. And it's really exciting to see what's next for you. So thank you so much for being on today. No, thank you for having me, Tracy. I know this has been really fun. Thanks. And if you're enjoying Crushing Classical, please uh, write a review on iTunes and come and join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical and on Instagram at crushing classical. Thank you. Bye.